Welcome to Radiology Case Review, Ultrasound of Acute Appendicitis. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters. This episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. I'm going to show three unique cases of acute appendicitis in pediatric patients, highlighting key teaching points throughout. Now, let's start with a look at the normal appendix. So here we're in the right lower quadrant. We're using a high-resolution linear transducer, and we can see the cecal apex here giving rise to this tubular structure representing the appendix, and that's overlying the iliopsoas muscle here. To identify as the appendix, we need to see a blind-ending tip, as we notice on this image. The appendix normally measures less than 6 millimeters in size, and we can also see some echogenic material within the appendix showing dirty shadowing consistent with gas, which can be physiologic. If this was an appendiculate, they would show a darker, more homogeneous posteroacoustic shadow. Now, if we zoom in a bit, we can see that the appendiceal wall has similar signature to bowel on ultrasound, so it has that outer echogenic serosal layer. As we move inward, we can see that there's a hypoechoic muscularis propria layer. Then we get this echogenic submucosa, and deeper still, the muscularis mucosa, which is hypoechoic, and then this thin linear echogenic area is the superficial mucosa opposed against each other. So typical stratification for the normal appendiceal wall. All right, let's start with case one. So this was a four-year-old patient with right lower quadrant pain. So we're in the right lower quadrant, and we see this dilated tubular structure filled with fluid and with a thick wall and also expansion of heterogeneously echogenic surrounding periappendiceal fat. To confirm that this is the appendix, though, we want to make sure that there is a blind end to this tubular structure, which is nicely labeled here. And also, it's helpful to add color Doppler imaging to evaluate wall hyperemia. And we see some areas of dot increased vascularity within the wall. That can be normal, but when you see this curvilinear or linear continuous flow, that's usually highly specific for an inflamed appendix. Again, we can also see some periappendiceal fluid adjacent to it. Another way to bring out vascular flow within the wall is to use microvascular flow imaging. That's known as MV flow on the Samsung RS85 Prestige. And it's a great way to further delineate the flow morphology because it can detect slow flow in small caliber vessels. We can also see on these images that there's extensive periappendiceal hyperemia as well, indicating surrounding inflammatory change. Now we're looking at the short axis dimension of the appendix, and we're doing a non-compression and a compression view. A normal appendix will be compressible, but you can see this appendix is not. It's also quite dilated, measuring 0.9 centimeters, consistent with appendicitis. Now the focal zone here has been lined up to another finding that further supports the diagnosis of appendicitis. You may have already noticed it. Here are the transverse and sagittal images. And there's an appendicolith here in the proximal appendix. You can see that it has an echogenic anterior margin with posterior acoustic shadowing here. And lining up the focal zone to the area of interest further will improve shadowing by narrowing the beam width. So what's happening here is this appendicolith is obstructing the appendix, causing it to become inflamed. And this is different from just seeing gas in the lumen because that will be more ill-defined and will have dirty shadowing instead of this homogeneous posterior acoustic shadowing. Now, it can be quite helpful to evaluate the appendix on real-time imaging as opposed to just static images. Here we can nicely see the appendicolith at the appendiceal base with the posteroacoustic shadowing. And then also notice how the wall is extremely thickened with the surrounding expanded echogenic fat and fluid. And what else do we notice that we haven't yet described fully on the static images? Well, here the appendiceal wall looks like it's intact at the tip, but as we move slightly to the edge, it becomes discontinuous. We see the thick wall here just ending also posteriorly here, and then this is all perforated appendicitis at the tip with a small amount of adjacent fluid, and that was confirmed at surgery. Now let's look at some key points for that first case, and you can also find these in the episode show notes. So for acute appendicitis, ultrasound is typically the first line imaging modality in pediatric and pregnant patients due to the lack of ionizing radiation. Now, the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound is approximately 80% in the diagnosis of appendicitis, but keep in mind that ultrasound is very operator dependent, requiring a high level of skill and expertise. A high resolution linear transducer using graded compression at the site of maximal tenderness is the typical technique. That involves using gradual increased pressure to displace the overlying normal bowel gas. And an inflamed appendix will typically be non compressible, appearing as a blind ending tubular structure arising from the cecal apex. For the diameter of the appendix with compression, less than 6 millimeters is almost always normal. 6 to 8 millimeters is a borderline measurement, and greater than 8 millimeters is highly suspicious for acute appendicitis. So secondary findings that can help you, particularly when you have that borderline measurement, would include a thickened wall beyond 2 millimeters with hyperemia. And as we demonstrated, dot flow hyperemia in the wall can be normal, 
but continuous linear curvilinear flow is highly suspicious. More specifically, studies have shown that if that linear flow is 3 millimeters or more, that's about 95% specific for acute appendicitis. But it's not as sensitive, so you won't always see that hyperemic flow. Due to the surrounding inflammation, increased echogenicity and expansion of the periappendiceal fat is often seen due to infiltration by inflammatory cells and edema. And a hyperechoic appendicolith with postacoustic shadowing is a supportive finding, but it's not always present. And you can occasionally see appendicoliths in patients with normal appendices. All right, let's look at case two. This was a 14-year-old patient with right lower quadrant pain. So here we're starting with a sagittal image showing the abdominal wall musculature and a small amount of free fluid in the right lower quadrant. So that's a nonspecific finding by itself. However, now in transverse view, we see the iliopsoas muscle here, and there's this tubular structure that we're seeing on FOSS that looks like an inflamed appendix. There's also expansion and increased echogenicity of the surrounding fat. When we had color Doppler flow, we see multiple areas of prominent dot flow, but we do also see this linear flow as well, supporting an inflamed appendix. And although the appendix is slightly compressible from 1.4 to 1.1 centimeters, it still is quite distended beyond the normal 6 millimeter measurement. On sagittal imaging, we see it has a dilated tubular structure with a thick wall. We do see some normal stratification still of the wall, and there's some intraluminal debris. But at this point, we don't know on these images, could this be the adjacent ilium? So we need to see that blind end, which we nicely demonstrated here, showing that this is the appendix. Now, you can still be fooled, though, because sometimes adjacent overlapping bowel loops will give the illusion that this is actually the end of the appendix. So it's helpful to identify the adjacent terminal ilium separate from the appendix. So here on the sagittal image, this is the cecal apex showing the appendix arising from it separate from the terminal ilium, which will arise about two centimeters above the appendix. Let's look at that on real-time imaging. So here we're looking at a transverse right lower quadrant cine, and this is the cecum here, and this is actually the adjacent terminal ilium. And as we move, you'll see that there's the appendix starting to arise from the cecal apex right here. That's appendix. This is the adjacent terminal ilium. And then we can follow it as it moves away from the terminal ilium. Here we're looking at purely the appendix there. And notice how the wall is extremely thick and the surrounding echogenic expanded inflamed fat. And then as we move further, you can nicely see that the appendiceal tip is well demarcated. And as we move back and forth, we can see that there's no overlapping bowel loop. So that truly is the blind end of this inflamed appendix. And again, there it is separate from the terminal ilium. So it's important to identify the cecal apex origin of the appendix separate from the terminal ilium so there's no confusion. And just a few key points for case number two. As we mentioned, identifying the terminal ilium separate from the appendix will help you differentiate from other abnormalities like ileitis, Meckel's diverticula, which is a congenital diverticulum typically arising from the distal ilium that can mimic the appendix, as well as other small bowel abnormalities. Another clue is that the appendix does not exhibit peristalsis. So if you see peristalsing tubular structure, it's probably not the appendix in its adjacent bowel loop. And seeing right lower quadrant free fluid, as in this case, as well as lymphadenopathy, are supportive features, but they're not specific by themselves. They can be caused by many other things besides appendicitis. All right, let's look at the last case. And this was a difficult case on ultrasound. This was a five-year-old patient, also with right lower quadrant pain. So here we're looking at a inflamed, markedly abnormal appendix here. We've lost the normal stratification of the wall. And there's heterogeneous expansion of the surrounding echogenic fat, as well as some irregular free fluid. When we had color Doppler, there's not really much increased flow, right? We're seeing a few areas of dot flow in the wall that can be normal. We see a bit more flow when we use directional power Doppler, as power Doppler is more sensitive for detecting flow, but it's still a bit less than you might expect for a markedly inflamed appendix. Here we see a bit of flow as well on transverse images of the appendix. Just an adjacent landmark, this is the iliacus muscle and part of the iliac bone that we're seeing. The appendix is not significantly compressible, and it is still dilated, measuring 9 millimeters. And when we look back at the intraluminal contents on the sagittal views, do you think that these represent appendicolis? They're echogenic, but then we don't have dense posteracoustic shadowing. We have this dirty shadowing typical for intraluminal gas. Now, when we look at that further on this sagittal cine clip, we can see it more clearly appears to represent gas, these amorphous echogenic areas within the lumen, again with dirty shadowing. And then there's the appendiceal tip here. Notice the thick wall. Now, what do we see here as we move beyond the appendix? We see some more areas of this echogenic shadowing gas. Is that in the appendix? Is that an adjacent bowel loop? Well, we can see it's separate from the appendix, and there's no bowel there. But there is actually this fluid collection that's filled with internal debris. 
I'll just move back and forth to demonstrate that this is a periappendiceal fluid collection containing gas. We can also see that on the static transverse image here, although it is difficult to delineate, this is the appendix here containing gas, and this is actually the collection adjacent to the distal appendix with the non-dependent echogenic gas. And we can see that better again on the transverse cine clip showing the appendix here containing the internal gas, but then notice that there's this adjacent periappendiceal fluid collection near the distal appendix containing non-dependent echogenic gas. And just to show you that on static images, there's that collection on sagittal images with the non-dependent echogenic gas. There it is on transverse images with the adjacent appendix. And because this was a complicated case, the patient also had a CT scan, which show very similar findings to what is seen on the transverse image. The blue arrows are pointing to the collection with the non-dependent gas here and the adjacent appendix. So you can see that there was a perforation leading into this developing abscess. And we can also see that on this image, the collection with the adjacent appendix. And notice how both the appendix and the collection appear thick-walled. So key points for this final case, at surgery, this actually was not just appendicitis with perforation, but it was also gangrenous. And the appendix had areas of focal gray-green discoloration on visible inspection with surrounding fibrinous exudate and adhesions, which complicated the surgery. So finding that there's loss of wall stratification raises your suspicion for necrotic or gangrenous appendicitis on ultrasound. Also in this gangrenous appendicitis, you may actually lose color Doppler flow, and that may explain why it was relatively diminutive on this study. Now, gas in the appendix will appear as dirty shadowing, sometimes with ring-down artifact. And the literature on this finding is somewhat conflicting, but it can sometimes be helpful to exclude appendicitis because appendicitis usually occurs due to obstruction of the lumen and it becomes fluid-filled, expelling the gas. So seeing gas in the appendix is sometimes a reassuring finding, but it can also be seen in the setting of gangrenous complication or perforation. So you have to weigh the presence of gas with the additional findings. Now, anytime you see periappendiceal gas containing collections, that's highly suspicious for appendiceal perforation. In complex cases such as this one, CT may be needed for clarification. And a couple of great references if you're interested in learning more. Here's an article by Dr. Nikhil Madhurapan et al. on the borderline size appendix and improving specificity. Excellent article. Another by Dr. Sarah Fallon et al. describing an ultrasound scoring system for appendicitis as well as providing a useful reporting template. All right, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you found this educational, and thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material that I post throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Radiology is life.